but we'll see. All right. Okay, everybody. So, um, if you know me in my work life at all, then you would know that I am a big fan of process. I really, really see the connection between process and people, and that when I see bad process, people are miserable in their jobs. And when it's done right, that um, it can really be quite freeing and that um, and helpful. So I, I really love process and you're going to see that at the end of this teaching, I'm going to swing back to that. So that's just a little teaser there, but I'm going to be reading in the book of Daniel or take us to the book of Daniel today. And that, um, in the book of Daniel, uh, Jerusalem has been sieged by the Babylonians and taken the Israelites and brought them to Babylon. And that this is a pretty, you know, gut wrenching thing, right? I mean, Hey, we were all supposed to be in Jerusalem and the temple, you know, the temple gets pillaged, you know, the people are taken away, you know, it's a bad time. And that, you know, you think about, you know, what this was like for God and how did this happen? And um, so I'm going to, I'm going to actually going to, before we really go to Daniel, I want to take us to Ezekiel 511. So if you turn to Ezekiel 511, that it shows what was going on with the relationship between God and his people. And that um, it says here in 511, therefore, as I live, says the Lord Yahweh, I'm reading out of the REV, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things and with all your abominations, Therefore will I also diminish you, neither will my eyes spare, and I also will have no pity. A third part of you will die with the pestilence and with the famine, will they be consumed in the midst of you, and a third part will fall by the sword around you. Um, so I wasn't really going to go that much further with the 511, but the thing if you look at it in other versions, it makes it pretty clear that they had actually taken, you know, man-made objects, idols representing false gods and brought them into the temple of God. Like that kind of hurts. <laughs> and then um, if you go to Jeremiah 2.8, Jeremiah 2.8, There we read that, you know, here we're talking about the priests that are supposed to be ministering, you know, to God. And it says, the priests quit asking, where is Yahweh? And those who handle the law didn't know me. The shepherds also transgressed against me. And that word shepherds in the Old Testament, a lot of times is relating to the leaders of people. And the prophets prophesied by Baal. Like, hi, you could prophesy by God. or hey. Forget that. Let's prophesy by Baal. I mean, are you kidding me? Um, and walked after the things, after things that do not profit. So, yeah, that was um, prophesying by Baal instead of looking to God. That's, that's pretty heartbreaking, too. Um, let's go to Jeremiah 42.9 now. And in Jeremiah 42, 9, it says, um, going back a little, that the word of Yahweh, in 7, it says that the word of Yahweh had come to Jeremiah. So um, in 9, it says, and said to them, this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says to whom you sent me to present your supplication before him. So the people had asked Jeremiah to go to God, and this is kind of the response. If you will still live in this land, then I will build you up and not pull you down, and I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I grieve over the distress that I brought on you. Don't be afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Don't be afraid of him, says Yahweh, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. I will grant you mercy that he may have mercy on you and cause you to return to your own land. But if you say, we will not dwell in this land, 
so that you don't obey the voice of Yahweh your God, saying, No, but we'll go into the land of Egypt where we will see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger or bread, and there we will dwell. Now, therefore, hear the word of Yahweh, O remnant of Judah. This is what Yahweh of armies, the God of Israel, says. If you indeed set your faces to enter into Egypt and go to live there, then the sword that you fear will overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine about which you are afraid will follow close behind you in Egypt, there in Egypt, and you will die. Um, so, and yeah, I'll read 17 too. So will it be with all the men who set their faces to go into Egypt to live there. They will die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, and none of them will remain or escape from the evil that I will bring on them. So the picture here is that God even told them, you know, they were departing from God. God sent prophets back to them. He's like, hello, you know, things are getting scary around them. It's getting really bad. You know, God's like right there. Hi, call me. I'm right here. And they're instead they're like, yeah, I think we'll prophesy by Baal. Bring a couple idols into the temple. You know, things look bad. We can go to Egypt. They'll save us. You know, but they didn't just turn to the God who is like begging them. Hello, call me. I'm right here. They just wouldn't do it. And that it, you know, so then they end up in Babylon. And so they're basically like, you know, slaves there. They're captured there. They're not the free people they were in Jerusalem. So now, now you've got the setup. Now we can go to Daniel 1. And that's Daniel chapter 1. And I'm going to start us off in verse 6. And in verse 6, it says, Now, among these, so they're talking about the captives of the children of Israel in Babylon. And they said, Now, among these were of the descendants of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The captain of the eunuchs gave, them, gave names to them. To Daniel, he gave the name of Belteshazzar and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Now, here's the thing about that. I mean, it's, it's kind of cool, you know, you're on a sports team, and, you know, somebody, you know, makes some great play or something, and you go like, wow, that was the fastest run we ever saw. We're going to call you Speedy for now on or something. I mean, nicknames can be kind of cool and endearing, but check these out. Have you given me presenting rights? Because I don't want to present. Here we go. I'm going to share my screen. Um, all right, so I don't know if you can see this, if it's centered very well or not. Can you, can you see that? So the name Daniel, that's his Hebrew name. Did you, is that it? Did you see it? Yes? Okay. All right, so Daniel, that's his Hebrew name. And let's see if I can enlarge this a little bit, so maybe it'll be even easier to read. There we go. I like that. All right, so the Hebrew name Daniel it has a meaning to it, and it means God is my judge. Every time they call you Daniel, it means God is my judge. But yeah, when you come to Babylon, now we're going to give you a Babylonian name of Belteshazzar. And what that means is Belti, protect the king, or protect his life. And Bel is a pagan god. So instead of, you know, God being the one to judge, now we're looking at a pagan god, and the focus is protect the king. Uh, Bel's the pagan god worshipped in Persia. All right, Hananiah, that guy, his Hebrew name was Yah is gracious. Maybe I should go back to something a little bit more reasonable here so we can fit it on here. There we go. Okay, Hananiah means Yah, which is kind of a shortened, abbreviated name for Yahweh. Yah is gracious or graciously given by Yah. So we're looking here for, you know, God being, you know, giving to his people, that that's what Hananiah means. Shadrach means command of Aku. Aku is the moon god. And that the, the Aku, the moon god, is going to, like, command us. Tell us what to do. Tell us what to do, Aku, the moon god. I mean, how insulting is that? You know, it's like, 
um, okay, Mishael here. Mishael, his Hebrew name means who is or who is as El, which is another name for, for God, right? And they give him the name of Meshach. Who is a cool? Who's the moon god? I mean, oh, just quit it. These are agonizing to me. I look at these names and it's like Azariah, helped of Yah. This should be Yah, not J, or Yah has helped. So Yahweh helping us. They call him Abednego, servant of Nebo, who's the Babylonian god of wisdom. It's like if you were a really, you know, smart, kind kid, and we gave you a name that was smart, kind kid, and that instead we decided that we're going to call you, um, we're going to call you, you know, like, meanie, stupid kid. You know, it's like, how would you like to grow up having people call you meanie, stupid kid, meanie, stupid kid? I mean, it's just like, so opposed to who you are and the core of who you are. And that's the names that they gave them for these Babylonian names. So, yeah. I, uh, but, you know, these guys did not let it uh, take it down. They kept it together. So let's keep reading. Let's go to Daniel uh, 117. So um, now, as for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and skill and every kind of literature and wisdom. And you'll see if you read the section between 6 and 17 that, um, that they were doing some things that were straight up by God too, to the best of their ability that they could do in that environment. They were like planting their feet and saying, you know, we want to do what we understand that God wants us to do, that that was where their heart was. And here it is, God's giving them understanding in all visions and dreams. Verse 18, at the end of the days that the king had appointed for bringing them in, the captain of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon at this point. And so he's the one that actually said, you know, these, these four guys, they were like teenagers. And he had said in the beginning of the book, you'll have to, you know, if this interests you, go back and read the whole thing, I encourage you. But um, in the beginning of the book, he's like, Okay, so we got these Hebrew people, they kind of speak a different language, we're in Babylon, you know, we speak Aramaic and stuff. You know what, let's get some of the young teenagers, we can kind of influence them, and you know, let's teach them the Babylonian language, and then they can just insert them back into their, you know, their regular families and everything, and they'll teach them how to be good Babylonians and stuff. And so, you know, so that was kind of the plan with that. Um, so they had given them all this training, and then they bring them in front of the king. Verse 19, the king talked with them, and among all of them, no one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Notice how they're using the Hebrew names here? I like that. And you'll see in this book that they switch back and forth a little, and it's kind of interesting how that goes. Therefore, they stood before the king. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters who were in all his realm. Daniel continued even to the first year of King Cyrus. Okay, that was 21 didn't really matter too much for this context, but but he the king noticed how wise you know these these guys were. So now we're gonna bump the story up into chapter two. And hang on just a second here. Sorry about that. Disruption. There we go. All right. So in chapter two, um, we're going to take, we're going to read quite a bit of this. So I'll be reading verses one through 16. So chapter two, verse one, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, again, he's the king, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep went from him. So whatever these dreams were, they bugged him so much he couldn't even sleep. It was troubling. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the enchanters and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So, you know, that was his normal MO. Those were the guys he'd consult with. That was the first line. So they came in and stood before the king. The king said to them, I have dreamed a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in the Aramaic language. Oh, king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. 
the king answered the Chaldeans. Now, I'm going to put a little attitude into this answer here. This is not the way the REV is written, but when I'm reading this, this is how it's hitting me. So this, the king answered the Chaldeans, yeah, this is what I decided. If you don't make known to me the dream, not just what the dream means, but the dream itself. You tell me what I dreamt. And you're going to see that there's trust issues here, that going down further into it, that he, he is a little bit suspicious of giving these guys his dream and then having them tell him the interpretation. Uh -uh -uh. Not this time. No, you tell me the dream. Then I'll know if the interpretation's good. So here we are back in uh, verse 5. The king answered the Chaldeans, this is what I have decided. If you don't make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be cut in pieces and your houses will be made a dunghill. You know, I, I, uh, I've heard crass terminology that pretty much reflects this. It only just goes to show that, you know, the phraseology lives on. <laughs> um, but if you show me the dream and its interpretation, you'll receive gifts and rewards from me in great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. So they answered the second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we'll show the interpretation. You show me first. The king answered, I know for certain that you're trying to gain some time. Buy me some time. Let me think about it. Because you see that this is what I have decided. But if you don't make known to me the dream, there is but one sentence for you. For you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me until time has changed things. Therefore, tell me the dream, and then I will know that you can show me its interpretation. Tough one, huh? The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can declare the matter for the king. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The king is asking a very difficult thing, and there is no one else who can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with the flesh. Well, you know, at least they're starting to get close to the answer there. <laughs> Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went forth, and the wise men were to be slain. And they sought Daniel and his companions to be slain. I mean, they weren't called in front of the king. He wanted the enchanters and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans and all that stuff. He didn't call, you know, the Israelite youths yet. And yet he had grouped them in, you know, as consultants. And if he's taken them out, they all get out. But they didn't even give these guys a shot yet. Now here, here's where it starts to get pretty exciting for me. Then Daniel returned answer with counsel and prudence to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard. So this Arioch, you'll see earlier in the book that he was kind of put in charge of them. You know, that he was the one who was supposed to like, you keep an eye on these teenagers type of thing but he was the king's guard. Then Daniel returned answer with counsel and prudence to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who was gone forth to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so urgent from the king? Notice he didn't say, that's wrong, he shouldn't do that. He just said, uh, what's the sense of urgency? That was, that was a pretty good, you know, thoughtful way to respond to him. Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would appoint him a time that he would show the king the interpretation. So he's like, give me a shot. Give me a day. You know, do you tell me when to come back? But I will come back and I'll let you know. So that was a more prudent way to buy some time, you know, than what, what those other, than, you know, what the king sensed of his other uh, group of counselors. So now verse 17 this is where this is where the blood my heart starts to pump this is where my blood starts to flow in this whole story i read this and i just went nuts then daniel went to his house and made the thing known to hananiah mishael and azariah his companions that they would desire mercies 
of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his companions should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So the first thing they do, you know, they're, they're, they're you know, looking at some stress. First thing they do, pray. Let's go to God with this. That's the first thing that they do. I love that. Okay, then number two. Then was the secret of real to Daniel in a vision of the night. Now, I can tell you that if I prayed for something and I got the answer, I, you can pretty much guarantee I know what I'm doing next. I mean, that that's a done deal. But before he even executes on it, I mean, the plan's in place, but before he even has a chance to execute it, uh, on it, then he goes to this step. Um, then was the secret revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And so I read these words, Daniel answered, and this is just amazing, awesome to me. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells in him. I thank you and praise you. What was that? I thank you and praise you. Again, I thank you and praise you. Let's go for four. I thank you and praise you. This is a five situation. I thank you and praise you. You God of my fathers who have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we desired of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Now, we could read the rest of the chapter for fun, you know, if you want to. I don't know. We could look at the time here. I've been, you know, taking up a half hour here, and I got a little bit more to go. So, you know, maybe you can go back to that on your own if you want. But, but you'll see that it's quite a complicated dream. It deals with future kingdoms and some of those when I say future are like way future future like end times kind of stuff that but but for sure it also applies to the king and it's spot on you know and the king can tell right away by Daniel's description of the dream that yeah if the dream is right then the interpretation is going to be right and Daniel gives him both the dream and the interpretation and that the king gets done with this and that after hearing all of this, and he starts praising, you know, the first he wants to praise Daniel, but quickly it becomes clear it's Daniel's God that deserves the praise. And Daniel makes that very clear, you know, that, you know, I got this. So this is, I got this from my God. Here's the stuff. And that he gets done and he's going, whoa, Daniel, you're great. Oh, and your God's good too. You know? <laughs> So, so it does go this way, but so I told you now that I was going to share things about process. And so I'm going to um, show you that this is a little flow chart. I like flow charts and I've made really complicated flow charts going into sub processes and decisions that create other sub processes. And, you know, it gets pretty obnoxious. Many people would fall asleep to this. No, I like it. But I came up with this one about uh, maybe a, a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago or something like this. And I put it up on the wall in my room and that I wanted to share this. So here's my little flow chart that I like. So it's, it's pretty simple. Oops, come on. Move over. Oh, well, you can see it. It says you start the process. The first thing you do is ask God. Just ask God, whatever you're dealing with, just start there. Step one, ask God. Step two, do that. Whatever he gives you, do that. That's step two. And then three, don't forget, give thanks and praise to God because it keeps the, keeps the wheels turning and then you're done. After you give the thanks, then you're done. This is my flow chart and that, you know, for all of the hundreds and hundreds of pages of flow charts I've dealt with, that this is probably the best one I ever made and the simplest one I ever made and the one that I find most applicable because, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, sums it up for me. So anyway, I want to thank you all for hearing my teaching today, and um, I guess we'll call it done, and I welcome any feedback or thoughts.
Michelle, that's awesome. Um, I just finished the book uh, uh, God at War. Um, it took me a while to read it. It's a fabulous book. If you, if anybody has not read that book, they need to pur you need to purchase it and read the book God at War by uh, Gregory Boyd. You know, I always knew that war was, you know, that God was at war with the adversary, with Satan. But I never saw how big of a motif that was in the scripture. It is a huge subject matter uh, from, from the beginning to the end, God being at war. And uh, Gregory Boyd lays it out so beautifully and so succinctly. Uh, but while you were reading and we're looking at this record of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because I'm, I can't pronounce the other names. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know, some fantastic things pop out. Uh, they recognized, Daniel at least, recognized the war. He knew that there was a war on, and he's in the middle of it. And instead of just giving up, he engages in that war. And he engages with God. And the purpose for us engaging in that spiritual war but we're in it whether we want to be in the war or not whether we whether we want to be a part of it or not we are in a war and uh you know, we have two choices we can stick our head in the sand and let the war come to us or we can engage and be in it and uh daniel decides to be in it and the purpose for us being in it, the end result should be that God is glorified on earth, that God is glorified. That is the end result of, of us being in the war because we're part, you know, when it says Yahweh um, of armies, the Lord of armies, we're in that army. We're a member of the armies. We're part of the army. And, um, you know, the book just, you, what you shared today just flowed right into what I had just finished reading. Um, you know, it, and it's really beautiful. Um, it, and I'll, I'm going to share some of this stuff later on in the month on, um, in the Wednesday night fellowship, but, uh, we are in a war and, and whether we want to be or not. And so what are we going to do? That's the question. What are you prepared to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to engage? And if so, then get engaged. And the end result of our being engaged in that war is that God is glorified, that he gets the glory, and which Daniel and those guys did. That's what's so beautiful about that record. Yeah, so if we're going to get engaged, we're going to need Michelle's flow chart. Yeah. <laughs> Just let me know, copies for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think if you have a gum wrapper and a crayon, you could probably re remake it yourself. <laughs> well, it's Michelle, funny, Michelle. Oh, go Michelle, ahead. you should make little pocket versions to, for like wallet sized versions of that flow chart. See, <laughs> you're ever sitting there going, oh man, I don't know how to deal with this situation. Just pull out your flow chart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny, Michelle, because you were talking about, you know, flow charts and the, I'm sure what you think of when you think of flow charts is exactly what popped into my head. And I'm like, oh, no, this, this won't even fit on an eight and a half by 11. Right. You know? And then you, you pulled that off. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that's about right. That's perfect. <laughs> Well, that's, that's the thing about the difference between good flowcharts and bad flowcharts. The, the bad flowcharts can be, you know, so complicated that people get lost in them. And then it takes so much time to look at them that they can't even do the job they're trying to accomplish. And they can't find the stuff that they're looking for, you know, and it's, it can be really, you go, is this good or is this bad? But good flowcharts, you can, you know, immediately know where to drill down to and get just to what you need to get the job done. That's a good idea, John Hickman, especially for those of us who have brain leakage. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, Dave, that um, you're never too young, nor never too old, nor never too impaired to be in the war. That's, that's for sure. 
Mm -hmm. I like that little reminder idea that John has. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, uh, you know, thinking about, oh gosh, the, the thought I had just disappeared. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Brain, brain leakage. Yep. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. And That's he's young. <laughs> Huh. You it's said, gone. Dennis, about getting in the war, or yes, it, some, it had away. something to do with being a part of the war, and uh, it's gone now. It'll come back. Hopefully. Have any of you read that book, God at War? I, I know. Have to read it again. No. It's fabulous, isn't it, Dave? No. No. It, it'll it'll really bless your life. Uh, it's fantastic work. Who's the author again, Dennis? Gregory Boyd. Okay. Um, Can you get it on Amazon? Oh yeah, not, Maybe that's what not uh, there'll be some that are called. Um, there's there's books by uh, a similar title like the God of War, um, something like that. Just look for God at War, right. Gregory Boyd. Yeah, the, the God yeah. of War is something very very different. Yeah, completely different. <laughs> that's a, no. that's a great teaching, Michelle. Thanks, Donna. That was great, Michelle. Gosh, maybe I wasn't supposed to say what I was going to say, and God just like zapped the thought away from me. <laughs> I think actually, I think you gave it to yeah. me. Gabe, yeah. you tell me if this was it. That at first, when Dennis was started talking, he said, you know, that you should decide if you're going to be in the war or not be in the war. But I think a lot of people are denying that a war exists. You know, that there's a lot of people out there that are ignoring the war. Like, doesn't affect me. I can go to work and, you know, eat my peanut butter sandwich. And I don't know anything about any war. It's, it's more like, mm -hmm. what war? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, can and I say I, something about that? Yeah, Sarah. I had a friend one time who we had this discussion about, you know, who was in control. This is always one of my favorite topics um, about who was in control and who wasn't and that kind of thing and evil. And, and she, she, she gave me an honest answer, but it was so shocking. I appreciated her honesty, but I, I still thought, did you think about that when you said that? Her response was, well, I just don't want to believe that Satan is really that bad. <laughs> and I thought to myself, so you'd rather think God was that bad. <laughs> you know what I mean mm. and I think it's not that, that they want to like sugarcoat and think the devil's great but it's just like they think that if they think that you know evil is really that evil you know that they would just be so overcome by fear um, and again understandably because they don't realize what they have in Christ and the greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world um, so it's a combination of not wanting to fear and not realizing what they have that makes for a lethal combination and just wanting to sugarcoat it. But yeah, I hear you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty neat in that record of Daniel, Michelle too, or in verse 17 of chapter one, where, uh, that the four men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Uh, uh, that was his gift, you know, that was his ability and that God, in, you know, was uh, uh, energizing that. But, but that should be able to be, or something like that, should be able to be written about each and every one of us. That, you know, God has, uh, God energized this in Sarah and this in John and this in Stacy. And, and, you know, that's what our lives are supposed to be. And then we engage that, that gift and that ability in the battle. But that, that was pretty cool. I, it was really neat to see that with just where I've been in the last couple of weeks. Sarah, something you said, you know, a lot of times for whatever reason, um, it is very difficult for people in our culture to realize that there are people or beings that exist who want nothing more than to see you die or to end, to end your life. And even though you've had no interaction with them whatsoever, they don't know you and they don't care. And that is a really difficult concept for our culture, which is very um, jovial and action consequence when there's, there's, there's absolutely no, 
your action or but you are going to suffer the consequence entirely. That's a very difficult concept for for people. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Every um every time I think about Daniel too, I'm reminded a friend of mine once she and just this is kind of a little praise report, I guess. Um, I'm always asking the Lord, help me give you more praise. Um, Stacy is really good at that. Every time I see her, almost the first thing off her lips is, guess what God did today? <laughs> you know, and she's got a list a mile long. So it's one of the things I like about her <laughs> the most. I'm always like, oh yeah, good reality check. But, um, a friend of mine years back, um, named Bonnie Mowry was having nightmares and she was just always asking me, pray for my, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. And so I finally just asked her, I was like, well, and the, the nightmares, all I knew was she would always dream that she was drowning. I mean, we're, she, we're talking, she probably dreamed that she was drowning 500 different ways, a thousand times for years. And her husband would pray for her and people from church would pray for her. So I finally just said, you know, I, at the time I was going through wisdom and we're studying a lot about wisdom. And I just know about Daniel and how God gave him lots of wisdom and dreams and all that. So I said, you know, Lord, I've been asking you for wisdom and I got a friend here who's having bad dreams. Would you help me? You know? And so I just poked around a little bit and, uh, anyway, long story short, was able to basically interpret her dream or why she was dreaming that she was drowning. And I knew that it was right because she got real defensive. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, Oh, I hit a nerve. And she's like, well, I'm going to just pray about this. She called me like, I don't know, a month later. She's like, Sarah, I have not had one dream about drowning at all. I think it was like spot on what you said. I just was kind of taken back by it. And so it was really, it was really cool. And as far as I know, to this day, she's not had any more drowning dreams. So I was like, praise the Lord. He can still do it. Not that's why that's my point here. It's just not something that happened 3000 years ago or however long you know, this, this book was written, um, the God of yesterday is the God of today and tomorrow and he's present and active and he still does these things. You did the flow chart. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yep. Sarah just checked off the last step of the flow chart. It, if by chance she <laughs> forgot at first, you know, that, that flow chart, apparently, it, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear. Sometimes we forget. I, I want to help out and remind, uh, or I want to add to Michelle's teaching. Sometimes if we forget to finish the flow chart, it's always okay to go back and finish it. <laughs> it's true with many processes. <laughs> yeah. It's actually better. It's better late than never. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've had people that have wanted to modify it and I'm like, Nope, I think that's actually quite good. <laughs> <laughs> No, It'd be really cool. cool to see that on a billboard somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, Michelle, I think you need to uh, put that into a PDF and, and add that to our virtual library. Give it a title of, uh, you know, the flow chart. <laughs> and uh, really, the flow chart, the Christian's flow chart. And, and just put that in the virtual library. That'd be fun. I'm going to print that out and laminate it. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm going to have to find a way to share it. I've only got it. Um, I, I have to see what I think I have it in PowerPoint or something like that. So you can save from PowerPoint into, you can just turn it into a PDF. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I can do that. If you, if you just do as. save as you can change it when it asks what file type you want, you can change it from PowerPoint to PDF. Okay. Or you could take a pencil and paper and make your own. Yeah, it, it's really simple too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can I share a tiny quick story? Yes. Okay. So about the spiritual warfare that we were talking about um, a little bit ago, I, um, about two years ago, I was a property manager for some apartments and um, I think <clears throat> I told Sarah the story. You had some, real evil people. There was a couple that just started doing horrible, horrible things to me. And it was this huge battle. And, and I was doing what my bosses wanted me to do. And we were trying to evict them. And, um, they got really personal towards me and were slashing my tires in my car. And it was, it was really bad. I mean, it was, it was, it was scary bad. And, um, 
Halloween came around and this lady hung this horrible, gruesome stuff out in the yard for everybody to see. I mean, like hung bodies and just nasty, nasty stuff. And, and I just, I didn't know how to handle this and deal with it. And I just finally, one day I just realized it went, this isn't for me to handle. This is spiritual warfare. This is the devil fighting through this woman. And as soon as I realized that it wasn't me against her or this company against a tenant, that it was a spiritual battle, life got good. I just, it took all the pressure off of me because I realized that God is the one fighting this battle, not me. I don't have to do anything. It's not on me. It's not on my shoulders. And since God's the one fighting it, we've already won. So sit back and watch. And it made all the difference in every day. It made all the difference in my safety. It made all the difference in how the situation turned out. And it was just awesome. And I just think we have to remember that it is spiritual warfare, but we've got such an amazing God. So we don't need to worry about it. It's, it's, it's him. We need to do what he asks us to do, but it's not me fighting against, it's not Stacy fighting against Satan. It's God. And, and I can hide behind our Lord and he's got it. Wow, that's pretty awesome, Stacy. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I just like this one. You like Stacy so much. <laughs> Say that again, Michelle. Yeah. I'm sorry. I said I get it now why you like Stacy so much. <laughs> yeah, I knew she fit right in. <laughs> Always I, giving I have praise. A so, Gabe, you were right I, about saving that thing. I don't know if you want to stop the recording or if we're still. I'll, I'll just edit it. Uh, okay. Jude, do you have a question? Jewel is my Jewel, Jewel. J-E-W-E-L. That's fine. That's fine. It's, it's hard to get that Jewel. name sometimes. I okay. just have a question about the, the spiritual battle, in which I totally believe, you know, everything I've heard. Um, but I'm wondering if Christians themselves sometimes are part of the the bad side. I mean, is that possible? You know, you know what I mean? Uh, does the devil or the Satan work through Christians, you know, in our lives as we come across people? Because sometimes can, it seems like that. <laughs> I can take that one. Um, okay. In the earlier part of the teaching, if you recall, I had mentioned that the priests of the temple were prophesying by Baal that the people that were supposed to be taking care of the temple were bringing idols into the temple. And that, you know, in as much as people are, you know, following the flow chart and stuff like that, that, you know, they're pretty much, you know, going to be people you can count on that, you know, are walking with God and stuff. But people that are, you know, Christians, but more focused on the world, that when they want to do what the world says, when they're, you know, drifting away from looking at what God is actually telling them, then yeah, they're at risk of, you know, giving you information that isn't accurate. And for every two denominations out there, there's going to be at least one piece of data that they don't see the same. And either one of them's right. not right or they're both not right, but they can't both be right if they're differing. And that, um, and that somewhere in there, somebody even with good intentions wasn't really going to God. They weren't really going to the Bible. They weren't really, really seeking God, you know, to get that unity of the body and everything. And they decided instead that they would, that, a new denomination was the answer and the split happened. So, and even though they may do, be doing a lot of things, you know, right, so to speak, and there's still our brothers and sisters in Christ, and they're still part of the body and we still need to love that we also can recognize that, you know, that there's going to be errors out there and that we need to be discerning even amongst you know, the, the body of Christ. And that's why it's important to do that whole Berean thing that whatever you hear, go back to the word, 
Look it up yourself. Own it. Own your own Christian experience. Don't latch on to somebody and think that you can just, you know, follow every single thing that they say, that you've got to be strong. You've got to own it. You've got to go back to the word yourself. You've got to pray, follow the flow chart, you know, go to God with it. Yeah. I can add to that too, in, in not just in um, erroneous doctrine, but you could also see it in the way that um, the devil uses certain Christian organizations to try to slanderize the name of Christians, right? So you like the organization, um, like the Westboro Baptist Church that goes around and protests at soldiers' funerals and says, writes very hateful, hateful things on banners mm -hmm. and has all these weird protests where they declare that God hates this and God hates that and um, that, you know, basically – by them condemning you and f making you feel like crap that that that's the way that that their god loves people and and we all know that to be erroneous but because they get so much attention um that and they get a limelight then they slanderize the name of christianity for everybody else too so sure the devil uses christians all the time uh to defeat our own defeat our own endeavors Think of think of how long it's uh, how difficult it has become to evangelize today because of organizations like that. Yeah, I'll add yeah. something to that you know, too, and then Dave and, Dave and Carol have their hand up really quick. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that we interact with on a day to day basis who either are Christians or claim to be, be Christians, and a lot of people's faiths nowadays don't go very far past, I believe in Jesus. And something that we always have to remember is that the devil believes in Jesus too. Uh, so like, you know, if, if you, if you are interacting with Christians who don't make their faith, don't make Christ a part of everything in their life, odds are in some way the devil is going to use them. Uh, we, we have physical hands and we also have spiritual hands and if we're not constantly using our spiritual hands they become idle and you know the old expression that idle hands are a devil's workshop um mm -hmm. you know we're gonna people are gonna get used we fight it i think we fight it and i hope we all feel it when we're we are engaged in that on our in a personal level we all feel that when the devil is really, you know, attacking our thoughts, attacking the things that we're, uh, you know, saying and doing and trying to manipulate us. So, yeah, I think absolutely, Jewel, that there are Christians that um, are working because they and they don't fight back and that they are and they do end up working for the adversary. But Dave and Carol had their hand up. So I want to go over to them really quick. Yeah, I just wanted to mm -hmm. tack on to probably what part of what John was saying is that there's false brethren too you speak you know read the book of jude um and then there's false brethren like paul had to put a couple of dudes out turn them over to the hand of satan i don't know exactly what that means but it sounds like they were brethren that had to be kicked in the butt because they were causing people's faith to shipwreck so we got, we got to be careful false brethren or, or brethren or and, and then there's that you know Make sure you what which Jesus are you talking about? Because there's another Jesus out there, you know that the devil puts forth. You know, uh, we had a little bit of experience last night at one of our last uh, family holiday get-togethers was last night, and towards the end, we were just uh, Carol and I and my brother-in-law and his uh, girlfriend, and he mentioned that. What did he say, Carol? They went. He, went to a Unitarian church.